Hi, I'm Brian Clark and welcome to another Recording Dojo. This time, I'm going to guide you through one of the most widely misunderstood and misused concepts in all of audio, compression. Tighten up your belts, the dojo is now open. What is compression? Well, essentially, it's a way of limiting the dynamic range of any audio material. It has five basic parameters, and I came up with an acronym to help me remember it. I want to share that with you now. I call it TKARR. T-K-A-R-R. -R. That stands for threshold, knee, attack, ratio, and release. Let's get into these five parameters to help you better understand how compressors work. Now I'm going to explain basically the signal flow of how material gets into a compressor. It starts with the very first parameter that we talked about, which is the threshold. I want you to think of, for a moment, compression as a big room with a front door and a back door. The threshold, our first parameter, is the front door. And it can be as stiff as a Fort Knox vault door or as flimsy as your grandmother's back porch screen door that lets everything in. It all depends on how you set it. What the threshold will do is determine whether or not any signal can get into the compression circuit and how much. If you have a very high threshold, that means it's going to be very hard for signal to get into the compression circuit. If it's a very low threshold, that means that anything can almost enter into the compression circuit and it's going to be affected. The second parameter of Takar is the knee. It comes in two types, hard knee and a soft knee. Essentially, what it does is work in tandem with the threshold and it has the capability to allow the compressor to ease into action or to snap into action. So if you have a threshold that's set very high and as the audio material gets closer and closer in volume level to the threshold limit, if you have a soft knee, it will allow the compressor to dip down and open the door, so to speak, for the audio to come into the compression room. If you have a very hard knee, it will snap open the door relatively quickly and allow the same amount of audio material into our compression room, so to speak. The third part of Takar is the attack. And attack times range wildly. In fact, they're highly dependent upon whatever program material you are trying to compress. You're going to set your attack times differently if it's drums rather than an acoustic guitar, or a highly saturated, distorted electric guitar, or a background vocal. All of your attack times should vary based on whatever program material and the speed at which they're coming in to the compressor. But understand this. Attack times can be extremely fast. On most outboard compressors, the attack time can be measured in microseconds. So how do we set it? Well, the best way to understand how to set your attack time is to understand a simple ADSR envelope. That basically stands for attack, decay, sustain, and release. The ADSR envelope is a natural phenomenon and a property of all physical sound. So imagine for a moment that you're sitting at your guitar and you just pluck your high E string with a pick. As soon as the pick leaves the string, the attack happens, a huge amount of transient energy is introduced, lots of velocity, followed by an immediate decay, and then a sustain, which is where we start to recognize the pitch. And then eventually, if we don't stop the note, it'll eventually decay on its own, and that's the release. Synthesizers, and for those of you who are into synths, will immediately know the ADSR envelope because that's where you like to play around and figure out, hey, what if I shave my attack time and have a huge release, and so on and so forth. So synthesizers offer a tremendous control over those four parameters. In the eyes of a compressor, though, they're just looking at that whole phenomenon as one big unit, and they're basically saying, when should I operate on this program material? So that's where you have to set it, totally based on the program material that you're putting in to the compression room. The fourth part of Takar is ratio, and it's always going to be expressed 
as a mathematical ratio. Most compressors start low, which is a 2 to 1, 4 to 1, and then increasingly go up. Sometimes it's in a Fibonacci sequence where it could go 2 to 4 to 8 to 12 to 20 to 1 ratios. In a technical sense, anything that has a compression ratio higher than 10 is classified as a limiter. So if you look at some compressors, it may say it's a compressor slash limiter. But that's really what it means, is that it's capable of using a higher than 10 to 1 ratio when it's being compressed. Basically, what you need to remember is that the lower the ratio of a compressor, the less compression that is happening. And the higher the ratio, the more compression that's happening. The fifth parameter of Takar is the release. And essentially, it's how fast we can clear the compression room and get the audio signal out of the compressor. So a very fast release time, and it can be measured in milliseconds most of the time, will clear the audio information out, reset the compressor, and it could be ready for the next drum hit, or it could be ready for the next pick stroke, depending upon how fast we've set the compressor. We'll look at this more in just a minute. That covers the five parameters of Takar. Let's see and hear this in action. Now, I want to suggest put on your best pair of headphones because if you're trying to listen to this over your laptop speakers, you're probably going to miss a lot of subtle detail that is really important. A quick break to thank our sponsor for Recording Dojo, Astrope Cables. Astrope Pro Audio Cables are trusted by artists and producers across the globe and feature a unique technology that delivers unsurpassed performance with an aesthetic and rugged design. You can learn more and buy their cables directly at astrope.com. Now back to the dojo. All right, hopefully you got your earphones on and you're ready to hear some critical testing. So I've pulled up a compressor behind me. Let me explain to you what I've done. Here we have the API 2500 bus compressor. And if you look in this compressor section down here, you're going to see all five of our parameters. We have the threshold, the attack, the ratio, and the release. Now, for those of you who are really astute may say, but Brian, you're missing the knee. Ah, it's over here in the tone section, and there's actually three choices on this particular model, hard, medium, and soft. Let's listen to this on a drum bus. So this is all the kit folded onto one track. I'm gonna pop this compressor in and out, and I'm gonna start playing with the parameters. But for right now, I've got it set in a spot that I actually like. I like what it's doing, and let me explain what's happening. So let's listen to it first. I'm going to bypass it just because I want you to hear the drums by themselves. So here we go. Okay, nothing to jump up and down about. Now let's put the compressor in and listen to the differences. Immediately I want you to listen to the ring and the room sound of the drums. You should hear a lot more ring of the snare. Check it out. Now that's a really cool thing because it can give the impression of much more energy and much more just strength of the drummer just pounding it out. A lot of that is just through creative use of the compressor itself. Let's hear how it sounds within the mix. So to do that, let me just kind of go to the solo section. And what I'll do is I'll play the drums without the compressor on it during the solo section and then pop it on and listen to how the drums have a whole different energy to them. Let me go over the kind of settings that I used on this compressor to achieve that result. I started with a medium threshold. This little LED light here is going to be indicative of the compressor actually working. So let me solo the track again. You can see that when it's flashing, that basically means that signal is getting into the compression circuit. You can also see the VU meters dipping 
uh, met registering the amount of gain reduction. Uh, on the attack time, I have it set to uh, 300 milliseconds, and my ratio is at a 3 to 1 ratio. My release time, and this is the big part of the magic right here, folks, is a very, very fast release time. In fact, what we're talking about now is um, 50 milliseconds. So that is very, very fast release time. And that's why it's starting to sound a little bit distorted, and you're also hearing a lot more room sound. Now, to help me prove that point, I'm going to play that same passage again. I'm just going to solo the drums so it doesn't get lost in the mix. But I'm going to play it again, and I'm just going to increase the release time uh, to a longer release time and listen to how it doesn't quite have the amount of energy and the room noise doesn't sound as huge. Check it out. So here's where we have it set now. This is our baseline for comparison. sounds much more tame and much more glued together, but it doesn't sound as punchy, and that room sound isn't really shooting up through the mix like it was. So I'm going to set it back. It just has much more of a punchy feel to do that. Now, if you don't get this on the very first listen, don't worry about it. Keep going over this again and again, and eventually your ears will start to go, oh yes, I do hear a difference. Not everything you do with a compressor is going to be like ice pick in the forehead obvious. So have some patience and allow yourself to adjust to the subtleties because once you do, all of those subtleties will add up to help giving you better mixes. Let's look at using compression on a bass now. So behind me, I've pulled up a mini Moog recreation from Arturia and our 2500 API compressor. Uh, I've basically left all the same settings that we used on the drums, but we really want to focus in on that release time again. We're going to listen for elements of distortion that happen within a bass frequency. It's kind of a cool thing. So let me play this little bass line that I recreated on a synth. I actually played it on the bass for the track, but for purposes of this demonstration, let's keep this going. So. Now listen to it with compression and listen how there's a little bit more sub and a lot more distortion. And longer sustain as well. Now you may go, how is that possible? How is a compressor adding all of that low end fuzziness down there? Well. Strange things happen with bass frequencies. They're long frequencies. They take a long time to unfold. When you have a compressor that's really, really quick, especially something that is quicker than 150 milliseconds on a release time, you will introduce distortion onto your bass frequencies. And a lot of times I prefer that because it adds an extra sense of harmonic richness and depth to a bass. It doesn't matter whether it's a synth bass or an actual bass that you've played in. So keep that in mind as you start to play with your attack and your ratios and your release times. If it's shorter than 150 milliseconds, you're going to start getting distortion, and that's not a bad thing. Let's use a compressor on a guitar solo. So I've pulled up the same compressor just because we're familiar with it, and it has all five parameters that we can adjust independently. I've put it on my guitar solo for this track. Let me play you a little bit of the solo without any compression, and then I'll put the compressor on. Here it is bypassed. Now I'm going to put it on and listen to the differences. It's going to glue the track together a little bit more and diminish the amount of dynamic range. Let's pop it in the mix and listen to the differences. All of those subtle details, the 
the little ghost note glissandos will start to come out more in the solo and the overall the guitar solo will be much more glued together and homogenized dynamically so that it'll stay above everything else that's happening in the mix. If we play that beginning part without any compression, listen to the difference. first glance, first listen, you may go, ah, it's not that much of a difference. But here's where it wins. Having a little bit of compression on there, and notice that I'm not getting a radical amount of compression. I'm not slamming the compressor. I'm just having it massage those dynamic differences even further to keep it above the mix. For a guitar solo, I think that that's appropriate. I would also be tempted to do the same thing on any solo and for the lead vocals. Keeping it above the mix is our primary job as mix engineers when we're in that headspace. Now let's put it on our two bus, our stereo mix. Uh, I'm gonna let you hear uh, the last chorus of this song with no compression, and then I'm gonna put on the compressor. I'm gonna overcook the compressor because I wanna show you the danger of using too much compression, especially on your stereo mix, on your two bus. So let's check it out. Here's with no compression. And now I'm going to turn it on. Uh, you probably saw me increase the ratio there, even though the compressor was off. Check it out and listen to how much it just sounds flat. Even if I increase the gain, which I'm going to do right now to get it at about the same level, it still sounds flat. Turning it off, we get a much more dimensional experience. What I notice immediately is that the snare drum can't poke through the mix. It can't really hit. It just feels covered up because it's being compressed. And the dimension, the spatial relationship between the tambourine and the two rhythm guitar tracks and all of the things that are going on, it just went from feeling like they're in a room and I'm inside that room to I'm outside of that room looking at it through a glass pane. That's sort of what it sounds and feels like to my ear. How can we use the compressor in a less egregious way and glue the mix together? Well, the first thing we want to do is lower our ratio values. So we're going to use something that's much more in line with what mastering engineers use, 1.5 to 1, 2 to 1 ratio. So I'm going to switch the API compressor down to a 1.5 to 1 ratio, which is here. And I will set the threshold to where we're just getting a little bit of dynamic range reduction. That's it. I'm just trying to massage it. It's a final massage. Let's check it out. Here's a little bit without, and then I'm going to put it in really quickly. Here we go. What I notice immediately is that the bass starts to jump up and feel much more present in the mix. And if you're listening on your headphones, like I mentioned you should, you should probably hear that. It's going to be subtle. It's not going to hit you in the forehead, but you're definitely going to feel like there's a little bit more oomph there. 
I, you probably noticed that I adjust the gain a little bit. It's very easy when you're using a compressor to think that louder is better, and that's not the case. You always want to gain match your compressor so when you toggle it on and off, you shouldn't perceive any volume difference. It should just sound the same. There was a little bit of a bump there, so I kind of cheated, but not really. Um, it's still within realms of tolerance for me. I know what it's doing. So always make sure that you do that so you're listening to what the compressor is actually doing rather than it just being louder and you thinking that it's better because then you can get fooled really easily. Finally, not all compressors will give you access to all five of the Takara parameters. In fact, that's one of the reasons I believe that compression is so widely misunderstood because you can go from one compressor to another compressor and the controls are in different places, the numbers don't mean anything, they're not measured in scientific measurements like microseconds or milliseconds. Some compressors are, others aren't. So my advice to you is to always make sure that you read the manual and understand the circuit topography and how the unit is designed before you just widely get in there and start moving knobs around. That's fun to do, but when it comes to critical analysis of a sound or you're really trying to tame something that's going to matter in the long run over the course of a mix or over the course of an entire record, you definitely want to know what you're doing. If you have any questions about specific compressors, leave comments below and or send an email and we'll get back to you. So hopefully by now you understand the five parameters of compression better and you feel more confident with being able to use compressors when you're tracking and when you're mixing, whether it's on single tracks, multiple tracks, or even an entire mix. Until next time, namaste.